And now question time to the Minister for the Economy. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number one. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. With your permission, I will answer questions one and, and also number four together. Since 2008, my department has channelled almost £64 million to encourage private sector upgrades to our telecoms networks, primarily in rural areas. Currently, 83 per cent of households in Northern Ireland can access the internet, compared to 86 per cent across the United Kingdom as a whole. 94% of premises in Northern Ireland can now access broadband services of 2 megabits per second or better. Across the UK, the figure is 98%. Broadband download speeds in Northern Ireland are continuing to increase. The average download speed now stands at 28.3 megabits per second, just below the UK average of 29 megabits per second. While there is no doubt that this investment has brought significant improvements for many rural dwellers, I recognise that more needs to be done. My department's Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Scheme uh, project sorry, has already improved broadband access for over 43,000 premises. This includes around 7,000 in Uri and Armagh and around 3,600 in East London Derry. The contract which was awarded to BT has a mechanism which requires BT to return funding for reinvestment when take-up of services exceeds a certain threshold, and this will allow more premises to see improvements. My department is also currently managing the Superfast Rollout Programme, which by 31 December 2017, will provide access to superfast broadband with speeds of at least 24 megabits per second to a further 39,000 premises across Northern Ireland, again primarily in rural areas. It is important to recognise that where fixed line broadband is not available, there are other technology alternatives that are available. Details of these can be found on my department's website. We also intend to publish further information to promote better awareness of broadband solutions. For those premises that continue to have access to services of less than 2 megabits per second, my department offers assistance with the cost of installing a basic broadband service using satellite or wireless technology. It ensures that no household or business which meets the eligibility criteria need pay more than £400 to access a basic broadband scheme over a 12-month period. Supplementary, Mr McNulty. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister, for your, for your response. Um, I'm sure the Minister will be aware that there are many residents and businesses in my own constituency who cannot access fibre optic broadband, and especially in places like Derry Noose, Armagh Brig, and in the heart of South Armagh. Can the Minister explain what future ambitions his department are planning for the delivery of broadband infrastructure beyond the continuing to connect strategy, which takes us up to 2017 only? I thank the, the, the member for his, his question, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, I mean, he's, he's mentioned some particular areas. If there are, and I would say this not just to the member, but uh, any members in, in the House, if there are areas where there are particular problems, um, and, and that they are detecting through their constituency work that there are more than one or two problems in an area, please bring those uh, to me. Um, I'll take a note of uh, the areas the member has mentioned. But if he wants to give us a little bit more detail, we can certainly take that forward and try to raise those issues uh, with providers. Um, in terms of, I mean, he mentions fibre specifically, and I think that uh, he and other members, and I would certainly acknowledge that it, it is not easy to provide fibre, certainly not super fast broadband fibre, to every premises in, in Northern Ireland. And there is a particular challenge in, in rural areas, and that's why I'm incredibly keen, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to, to make sure that members of this House who do receive a considerable number of complaints, I know as a member has identified, uh, are aware of the full range of services that are available, and that it isn't just. I, I think, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there is a bit of a view uh, that if you can't get fibre, that's it. You can't get broadband, uh, or you can't get acceptable speeds in broadband. And, and there has been support through a range of different, um, a range of different providers, a range of different technologies. Primarily, we are using satellite and wireless as well. Which, okay, don't provide maybe the speeds uh, that you could get through fibre in, say, some towns or particularly in some cities, but they will provide a decent speed uh, of broadband for, for people right across Northern Ireland. So there are a range of other alternative technologies that are available that I'm keen to make sure that members of this House, councillors, other elected representatives, and more importantly, customers themselves are aware of, so that whenever they do experience the problems, that they're aware of the full range of options that are available to them. Steve Aiken. Mr. Speaker, and to the moment. Uh, I just asked the Minister, and I, I thank the Minister for his comments he's made on the importance he's placing on rolling out superfast broadband as much as we can. 
But just related to sort of the questions, I'd just like to say what sort of discussions are the Department now having with Ofcom as we seem to be moving towards a universal service obligation, particularly around superfast broadband, and what can we do specific, specifically as we're looking forward to make sure the infrastructure is actually provided for this? Thank the member for, for, for his question. Um, the, yeah, the universal service obligation was something that was first mooted by the previous Prime Minister back in November of 2015, uh, and it was the government's plan. This is where there are, and I know the member appreciates this, that their um, policy responsibility primarily still resides with what is the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, and uh, uh, my department, the executive as a whole, has the ability to uh, catalyse, as we have, some investment in, in, in broadband and, and, uh, and through the range of different technologies. Uh, but Primary, primarily responsibility still rise with DCMS, um, and the, the government's plan was to give everyone access across the UK legal right to request at least a 10 megabits per second broadband connection by 2020. Now, I, I support the, the principle of a universal service obligation. It's important to note that the average speed in Northern Ireland is actually quite close. It's 28.3 percent, as I think, as I mentioned before. Uh, but there are obviously a lot of people who are well, well short of that. Uh, and in some respects, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I think the uh, Her Majesty's government's ambitions are, are perhaps too low, reflecting, I am sure, that the challenges that they understand that there are um, with rolling out broadband, particularly to, to rural parts of, of the United Kingdom. But the, the member will be aware that the program for the draft program for government target in respect of internet connectivity is that we should increase the number of people who are getting above 30 megabits per second. So I, I, I and the executive as a whole are a lot more ambitious about. Um, increasing and enhancing uh, internet connectivity and getting those speeds higher. Um, certainly, I'd be a member mentions Ofcom specifically. Um, I am due to engage directly with Ofcom on a range of different matters in the not too distant future, and I'm sure that the USO will be one of the, the subjects that we touch upon. Call Adrian McQuillan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Minister, how do you rate the performance of BT in delivering broadband to rural areas such as Molly Dyke, Ahi Dewey? Rings and Glen all, all rural areas in my constituency. Here, here's some, uh, I'm not sure whether Mr. McQuillan intended to uh, raise some mirth in the chamber when he asked that question, but I do hear and see some, some smiles around the chamber as well. I think, it, I think it's important, and like, like Mr. McNulty, um, I'll take note of the areas that the member has, has raised and I'm uh, happy to have some discussions with him about how we might be able to improve the service that, that those customers in those parts of his constituency, which are, are rural parts I know, um, have uh, received from BT. Um, look, I think we, it's important that we acknowledge that um, the work that BT has done as a company um, and the considerable investment that they have made, uh, especially in, in urban parts of Northern Ireland. And that, and that improvement uh, that I was able to uh, outline in my first answer is as a result of that pump priming, yes, by, by government here in Northern Ireland and indeed by, by DCMS, but also uh, the investment that BT have, have made. However, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it would be unfair um, if I didn't say that I had some concerns. I think it is not, it's not acceptable that even after that 60 odd million pounds worth of investment that we have made over the last number of years, that some 44,000 households still have speeds of less than two megabits per second. Uh, and that is particularly in rural areas. Uh, a lot of it in the west of the province, but not exclusively in the west of the province. I could, I could take the member and yourself, Deputy Speaker, and others to, to parts of my own constituency, which might be perceived as an area which would have better speeds which don't have good access to the internet as well. I have written, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to the Advertising Standards Agency regarding the accuracy of um, what I believe the, the inaccuracy of, of some BT broadband adverts, particularly where they advertise uh, up, uh, they, they advertise an up to speed as opposed, and I think I believe that they should be uh, advertising in particularly areas like his constituency, those areas that he's mentioned, an average rather than an, an up to speed. Um, it was part of the, the First Minister's plan for Northern Ireland that we invest in, in making sure that there isn't a rural digital divide. And I don't want to see two classes of internet connectivity in Northern Ireland between urban and rural areas. And it is worth noting, as I said before, that there are alternatives available to uh, those customers in those parts of his constituency, which I'm happy to work with a member on and trying to ensure that they have uh, a, an awareness of those alternative technologies that they might be able to avail of. Just before I call the next member, if we could just refresh the, the minister's memory on the two-minute drill. Okay, thank you. Agusanish, Iram Sir Cahal Boylan. I call Cahal Boylan. I appreciate the minister's answer so far, but the minister has to recognise that, given all the work's been done and all the cabinets that have been upgraded, uh, there's large swathes of rural Armagh and South Armagh that hasn't been facilitated. 
Would the Minister not consider now not only upgrading the cabinets and putting in new cabinets, which we'll know after 2017 in this programme, would he not consider fibre optic to house two premises itself? Because that's the only answer in some cases. Bear in mind, I do appreciate that those areas will require satellite broadband, but would the Minister consider fibre optic to premises, especially businesses? Or a uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, you know, I stand here charged with um, seeking to try to improve internet connectivity and broadband speeds and um, do so with uh, a range of limited powers that are at my disposal. I mean, the, mem the member is talking about putting fibre optic into largely rural parts of, of his constituency of Newry Armagh, and the same would ring true, I'm sure, for uh, all parts of, of Northern Ireland. But you know, that, that comes at a, a considerable cost. And we have made, and I know the member will acknowledge that we have made significant improvements over the last number of years as a result of the £64 million that has been invested since 2008. And I don't want to re-rehearse all of the, the improvements that we have made, but we have made some. And I, I do accept, though, that there are some parts of his constituency and others which don't have, and I mentioned the 44,000 households across Northern Ireland and all parts of Northern Ireland that don't have speeds in excess of 2 megabits per second. Now, I want to improve that. Um, the executive has an ambitious target within its programme for government. Um, um, but the member will appreciate that to, to do what he is asking uh, will require considerable investment. It is one of the things that I want to discuss uh, with Ofcom, and particularly with providers uh, like BT, is to see what, it, what is possible uh, and, more importantly, whether it is affordable as we, as we look at um, uh, budgets moving forward. I call Danny Kennedy. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I join with others uh, to, to, to press the Minister on the issue of uh, greater broad, uh, improved broadband provision, particularly in the New and Armagh constituency and in all areas of the constituency? The Minister will be aware that I uh, have had some correspondence uh, with him recently uh, uh, on this issue. But for issues, issues and for people, constituents in Claddy Milltown and areas of Bestbrook and Newton Hamilton, can we have an undertaking from the Minister that, that, that every possible effort will be made to investigate means by which they can have greater access to broadband? Because it is having an impact not only on communities but also local business. Yeah, thank the member for, for his question, Deputy Speaker. And, and he, he's right now, I accept the, the points that he is making. I, I, th I think this, is, this has developed particularly in recent years. Is, you know, if we were standing debating, the member has been in this House for some time, and, and I'm sure you know, whenever he first came into the, the House, the idea of debating you know, speeds of broadband speeds at the level that we are now experiencing in many parts of Northern Ireland would have been. We didn't have those, those sorts of speeds in this building, if I recall rightly, at that time, um, such as the progress has been made. Um, somebody still says, still not great behind me. Um, but you know, we have made huge strides forward, and I do accept that there are some parts of Northern Ireland which are, which are still not as good as they should be. Um, you know, I think we should acknowledge the investment that has been made, which has helped, particularly through the Broadband Improvement Project, which has helped 7,000 uh, additional premises get, get support in his own constituency. Um, and I am, as I've mentioned to other members, very, very, very keen to ensure that everybody is aware of the range of different te te technologies that are available, that it isn't, um, to go back to Mr Boylan's question, that they're thinking only of fibre and fibre alone. There, there are alternatives there that they may be able to access and get a decent broadband speed. So, I, and I accept, Deputy Speaker, that you know, a, a, perhaps a failing on, on our part in terms of not promoting those alternative uh, technologies properly, um, that that then has helped, uh, and perhaps with all the, the, the saturation of advertising from some particular companies, that that's all that they think that is available. And if you don't have that, you don't have decent broadband. So I am looking at this actively. We've been working with local councils, but I'm also looking at how we can better promote those alternative technologies, how we can use the network uh, of assembly members and other elected representatives and their advice centres around Northern Ireland to help to communicate those alternative technologies that do exist that can provide decent broadband speeds and good reliability uh, to people in many rural parts of Northern Ireland. Call Harold McKee. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just on the, I have to agree with what everybody has said. Sorry. Oh no, sorry, I had my hand up there for uh, for an intervention. Is that okay? Yeah. Right. Uh, question number two, Minister. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the fish sector in Northern Ireland provides excellent quality, high protein products and is well placed to take advantage of the increasing global demand for food. This sector includes both the catching and the processing of fish making an important and valuable contribution to the local economy, particularly to rural coastal communities, creating direct employment and supporting growth in its wider supply chain. In 2014, 
The total volume of fish caught and landed by Northern Ireland registered vessels home and abroad was 57,300 tonnes, worth £55.7 million. During 2015, the total volume of fish landed into Northern Ireland ports was 22,500 tonnes, worth £28.2 million. The fishing fleet comprises 364 vessels and in 2015 employed 708 full-time and 151 part-time fishermen. In relation to the fish processing sector, it is estimated that gross turn turnover in 2015 was £76.1 million, pounds, representing 1.7 per cent of the total turnover generated by Northern Ireland's food and drinks processing sector. Export sales made by the fish and aquaculture processing sector were £41.2 million, pounds, representing 4.2 per cent of the total food export sales. In 2015, in Northern Ireland, there were 25 registered processing facilities employing 484 full-time and 232 part-time staff and paying an average wage of £17,875. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Invest Northern Ireland actively engages with the fish processing sector and offers a wide range of support, acknowledging the quality of the produce both caught and processed in Northern Ireland. There is no doubt the positive contribution the sector makes to the local economy and the quality of the products caught should be recognised. During 2016, two fish processors achieved success in the Great, great Taste Awards in recognition of the quality of their products. And they were Rooney Fish, who are based in Kilkeel, uh, who achieved a top 50 listing and was awarded three stars for its specific oysters, uh, and Ewings from Belfast, who won two stars for its organic smoked Irish salmon. Over the past five years, Invest Northern Ireland has offered 1.1 million support in, uh, to the fish and aquaculture processing sector, which has levered uh, an investment of 5.7 million and promoted 70 new jobs. Mr. McKee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thanks for that so far, Minister. What can the Minister say and do to assure the Northern Ireland fishing industry that they have a bright future? Does he and the dear Minister have a plan to make sure the needs of local fishermen are heard at the highest levels in the negotiations around Brexit? The, I thank the, the, the member for his question. I, I, mean, I think it is a, and the member obviously represents a a constituency which has two of, of, of Northern Ireland's main uh, three, the Long Along as well, of course, uh, three of Northern Ireland's sort of four big fishing ports, um, and, and is incredibly, as, I, as I've outlined, an incredibly important sector to our economy. Uh, and, and it is an area which is a shared responsibility in many respects between myself and the, the DERA Minister. Uh, and we are, and um, we will continue to work very closely together on a range of agri-foods issues because we do think there are huge opportunities for Northern Ireland continuing uh, as we move forward. Um, in my department, Invest Northern Ireland works very closely with other departments in, in providing support uh, to this sector and recently gained uh, approval to offer support to the fish processing industry through a new fish and aquaculture processing and marketing scheme. And this initiative is now live, I understand, and will complement DERA's uh, Maritime and Fisheries Fund. Uh, with support for both capital and export marketing projects. In respect of, of, of the negotiations regarding Brexit, um, I do think there are huge opportunities for the fishing sector in Northern Ireland as a particular area. I mean, I represent uh, the port of Port of Ogie, as the member will know, and, and from listening to fishermen down there before and after the referendum, I think they see huge opportunities for their industry uh, as we move forward. Um, and in terms of ensuring that the particular interests of the whole of the agri-food sector in Northern Ireland, but particularly of fishing, are concerned. Uh, the DERA Minister and I have, have set up a, a group which actually met for the first time a few days after, uh, a liaison group which met for a, a, few, a few days after the referendum result. It is a meeting again tomorrow morning, and, and on that group uh, includes representatives of the, of the fishing industry and the fish processing industry in Northern Ireland, because it's incredibly important, as I've outlined, that their voice is heard as we develop our our, our thoughts on our way forward in dealing with the uh, negotiations as they as they crop up. Here, Mr. Colin McGrath. Call Colin McGrath. Very much. Uh, would the minister agree with me that the European Union funding has been of great benefit to the fishing ports, in, uh, certainly in my constituency, and and that the infrastructure that's there and that there will be peril in the future with this funding is in jeopardy? Uh, you know, yes, sir. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, you know, I, 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 would, I have to acknowledge that there has been investment into our, our fishing ports, much of which, of course, is, you know, from Europe, much of which, of course, had to involve match funding out of our own budgets to access that funding. But uh, as, as members behind me have, or have, have indicated to the member, and they're absolutely right in what they're saying, you know, when you go and you talk to fishermen 
and you talk to a fisherman in his constituency, and you go to the port in Arglass, and you go to the port in Kilkeel, and you go to the port in Port of Ogie, the one story that I have heard from all of my days representing the people of those areas, uh, the area of Port of Ogie, is that their, their hatred, and I think I wouldn't be putting it too strong, for the common, common fisheries policy, the damage, the absolute damage that it has done. And the member shakes his head. I mean, I, I have, I have, I'm very fortunate to have family from our glass, and I can remember sitting in my grandmother's house and my grandfather's house, looking down onto the port many, many years ago when I was a young man, not that many years ago, <laughs> and seeing a thriving fishing industry. Tens and tens and tens of boats coming in and landing their catch and it being processed, processed and benefiting the economy of the South Down area. And the same is true in Kilkeel and the same is true in Port of Ogie as well. What do you see today? Nowhere near the same industry. Nowhere, and, and what is the primary reason, Mr Deputy Speaker, given to you by the fishermen themselves? It is Europe and the common fisheries policy. So I'm sure that many fishermen, uh, and, and, and myself and others in this House and other representatives, will be very glad to be able to, to be free from that common fisheries policy and to develop a more sustainable future for fishing in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Call Jim Wales. Minister aware of the quite exciting proposals for the improvement of the port of Kilkeel on the harbour. Um, and what can his department do to assist that very interesting suggestion which would completely revolutionise the fish, fishing and the fish posting industry in that part of South Down. Mr Wells, for, for, for his question, and, and you know, unlike others who, who want to uh, perhaps shackle the fishing industry in Northern Ireland to uh, the road to nowhere, um, I want to try to help alongside the DERA Minister and the whole of the Executive try to restore uh, our fishing industry to its, its former glory. And I am very, I'm, very, I'm aware of the plans that, that uh, Mr. Wells references. I, I'm very excited about them. I think that they, they show a very, very positive vision for Kilkeel and for the fishing industry in South Down and for the whole of Northern Ireland. Um, I am aware that the, the, the plans would facilitate uh, large, modern herring and mackerel boats to land uh, in Kilkeel, uh, and that would be the only the second port in, in, our, in the whole of the island of Ireland where that would be able to be done, the, the only other port being, I think, Kelly Beggs. Um, it would bring, of course, employment and income into the area, um, particularly in terms of repairs and maintenance and also in, in respect of, of processing. And I think there are business units, other business units to be part of, as well as the processing side of it, other business units that would help to revive the local economy. I intend to um, I'm plan to visit the, the area to see um, a latest on the, the, the plan for Kilkeel Harbour. Um, I understand there are two studies required. One is a feasibility study and one is an environmental study. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am happy to inform the House that Invest Northern Ireland have convinced, uh, that, commenced that feasibility study in concert with the Strategic Investment Board. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this, this plan is all about regenerating Kilkeel, as Mr Wells has said, uh, and by putting, with the aim of putting fishing back at the heart of the local community and building a better future for Kilkeel and for the fishing industry. I'm very, very excited about the plans and uh, they have my full support. And I look forward to working uh, with the fishing industry in Kilkeel to, to put, take them forward and bring them to fruition. Oliver McMullen, call it Oliver McMullen. Minister, you have told us today that you, yourself and the dear Minister have already had discussions on the fishing industry. Did part of that discussion uh, form any, any plans you have for talking to the other regions, uh, England, Scotland, Wales, uh, regarding the, the fishing industry there and also with the, the counterparts in the south of Ireland? The discussions haven't uh, specifically, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I'm, I'm sure, I mean, probably a question better put to the Agriculture and Environment Minister, uh, who I'm sure will be very, very keen to, uh, in terms of developing a way forward for the industry, particularly in the uh, post-referendum context, uh, want to discuss the issues with uh, very closely, of course, uh, with uh, the UK government. I'm sure she, she took the opportunity to raise issues around the whole of agri-foods. In fact, I know she took the opportunity in, in the, the meeting that she had with David Davis, who is the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, uh, to make sure that he was aware of the particular circumstances that our agri-foods sector faces. Uh, and I can't speak for uh, the DRA Minister, but I'm sure that she will be wanting to keep in close contact with counterparts in Wales and Scotland and other jurisdictions as well as she, as she moves forward. I call David Hilditch. The Mr. David Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Invest in I, uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, Caterpillar has been a significant employer and an important investor in Northern Ireland for 50 years. For, for many of those years as FG Wilson's and since 1999 as part of the global US company. Given its strategic importance, Invest in I has always maintained a close relationship with both local and US management. 
of SNI staff work with the company on a regular basis, both at an operational level as well as at a higher strategic level where potential new investment opportunities are sought. The SNI's chief executive met representatives of the company uh, locally and local and U.S. teams in Belfast in May this year and again met with U.S. senior management at the company's U.S. headquarters in August. The decision by Caterpillar to seek 200 to 250 redundancies as well as the potential closure of its plant at Monkstown is very disappointing. I am mindful of the very direct and personal impact this devastating news will have upon the workers affected and their families at this time. I spoke to Caterpillar's Managing Director for the Northern Ireland operations last week to confirm that my department stands ready to provide all appropriate support to the workers affected at this difficult time. The Employment Service is already working with the company to be in a position to deliver specific support measures to the workers impacted. All relevant departments and agencies will help find alternative employment or through retraining to equip those affected to compete in the labour market. Caterpillar is one of our leading manufacturing businesses and will continue to make a valuable contribution to manufacturing in Northern Ireland, not least through the employment of more than 1,500 people in Belfast and Larne. Invest and I will work closely with the company to help strengthen this important presence in Northern Ireland. Supplementary, Mr. Hildich. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. There, there is clearly much concern within my own constituency and beyond regarding the Caterpillar situation. Can the Minister give his assessment of the stability at Caterpillar and indeed the position within manufacturing in Northern Ireland in general? Sir, Deputy Speaker, I had a very useful conversation with uh, Robert Kennedy, who is the, the Managing Director of, of Caterpillar's operations in, in Northern Ireland. And, and one of the things that he, was, uh, he and I both spoke about, and it is very, very clear from, from the decision, that this is not a um, – some may wish to portray it in this, this way – but this is not a, a sort of vote of no confidence in, in Northern Ireland as a place for the company to invest. Quite, quite the opposite. The company recognises the, the efforts of the workforce here in Northern Ireland and the competitive um, opportunities that investing in Northern Ireland presents to them as a firm. Let us be clear that the, the disappointing job reductions and the closure of the Monkstown plant come as a result of, of a huge global restructuring by Caterpillar, where 10,000 jobs are being lost uh, across the company in the next number of years. And that results from a, a significant and a sustained uh, downturn in Caterpillar's business, which has seen its, its revenues decrease by around 21 per cent over the last five years. And that's a huge chunk of revenue to take out of, of any business, and any business has to respond accordingly, particularly to slow down, as, as a business has experienced slowdowns in its business in China and in South America, both key markets, uh, and also a collapse in oil prices and the knock-on impact that that has on, on many of the products that, that Caterpillar, Caterpillar make. Um, there have been huge numbers of plant closures right across the, the, the company in, in, uh, in Germany and in Japan and in Indonesia. Uh, the day after the, the, the Northern Ireland announcement, uh, a plant of employing 2,000 people in Belgium was closed, uh, and even in the US in its hometown of Peoria in Illinois. There were also job losses. So this is not something that is specifically affecting Northern Ireland. It is something that is affecting a company who are having particular differences at this time. And in respect of the, the manufacturing, and it, it, when, when you listen to that and you see that, and the, you, you appreciate the, the impact that it has on 200 to 250 families in the community and, and people of, of the Monkstown area, uh, it is very, very difficult then to talk about how we have a, actually a, a very successful manufacturing sector as a whole in Northern Ireland. But the truth is we are. And some people want to paint the sector down and do it down. Uh, I am not a minister who will be talking down the manufacturing sector in Northern Ireland, particularly when they are doing well. Call Roy Bakes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the job losses will be devastating on individual families, uh, but this has come on top of previous significant job losses in 2012 and Caterpillar, JATI job losses, and indeed Michelin in the neighbouring region. Will the minister be responding? to the calls from unions and indeed business organisations and follow the official opposition's request that we should have a, a specific manufacturing strategy to ensure that the needs of industry are addressed and are not overlooked so that we remain competitive and cost effective. Sir, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's pretty sad to hear, to hear the member and indeed the Ulster Unionist Party and others come into this House and elsewhere and want to talk down the Northern Ireland economy are parts of the Northern Ireland economy. The truth is, and it is difficult to appreciate whenever you do get bad news like you do at Caterpillar, but the sector as a whole in Northern Ireland, the manufacturing sector, has been doing well in recent times. Uh, whether you look at jobs, which are up to 80,000 for the first time since, since 2008, sales, which have increased by 1.7% in uh, 2014, exports, which are now at £6.3 billion by the sector, which is um, 
at uh, up 30, 350 million on the previous year and output particularly on output, where it is up 2.4%, uh, where we are outperforming our manufacturing sector is outperforming the rest of the UK and has had a huge increase since 2009. I am very proud of those figures. I am very proud of particular successes that manufacturing companies in Northern Ireland continue to register. The fact that one in three London buses are made in Ballymena, that 40% 40 40 of the world's mobile crushing and screening equipment is manufactured here in Northern Ireland, and that 30% of the world's uh, airline seats are, are made down in, in Kilkeel. I'm very proud of those successes and will continue to, to celebrate them. Uh, let, let me be clear around a, a manufacturing sector strategy for Northern Ireland. If I, believed, if I believed that it would make a difference in terms of combating, as I said, downturns and slowdowns in markets in South America or in China, or could deal with falls in commodity prices like, like oil, I would have started work on a strategy weeks ago. But you know, I'm pretty sure that the member couldn't tell me, never mind this House, never mind the people working in the manufacturing sector, how a strategy, a, a specific strategy for manufacturing could do anything to deal with those particular problems. What we will continue to do is work very closely with the sector. Invest in I has provided £270 million worth of support since 2011. That has unlocked £1.9 billion worth of investment in the manufacturing sector and created 13,000 jobs. So I will continue to work with that sector. It's an incredibly important sector to our economy. Uh, and one that I want to see continue to grow. That ends the period for listed questions. I now move to the 15 minutes of topical questions. I guess Aaron Sir, Daniel McCrossan. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for his question or for his answer so far today. Can the Minister outline to this House what works his department has carried out to evaluate the impact that a potential Brexit will have on border areas, such as my own constituency of West Truro? Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, clearly, you know, we are dealing with a range of issues as a result of the uh, uh, referendum in the UK and the, the democratic will expressed by the people of the UK to, to leave the European Union. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know, there are some who, again, it's another example, of nothing but negativity. Come, people must have had a very, very bad holiday uh, across the way. Nothing but negativity and talking down Northern Ireland, talking down the opportunities. Uh, for our economy, and I do believe there are a huge number of opportunities for our economy that, that flow from, uh, from Brexit. Um, now, what I am focused on, what the whole of the executive is now focused on, is getting the best deal for Northern Ireland. Um, we are seeking to, and we are influencing Her Majesty's government position. Uh, the the uh, f good fortune over the summer to meet with uh, not one but three different cabinet ministers, uh, not including the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, but had good engagement with the. Minister for International Trade, Dr. Liam Fox, uh, the new Business Secretary, Greg Clark, uh, and as I mentioned before, David Davis. Uh, and we are working with, with them directly and with their officials at official to official level to ensure that they are well aware and very familiar with the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland and the issues that we want them to have to the forefront of their minds uh, as they enter into negotiations in the weeks, months and years ahead. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we also continue, I, uh, I personally and my department, officials in my department, continue to consult with business through particularly a liaison, liaison group that uh, Invest and I have set up. We've been meeting sectors, we've been meeting individual companies, uh, we've commissioned analysis and, as I mentioned before, we're working directly with Her Majesty's Government to ensure that we can get and we will get the best possible deal for Northern Ireland. Yeah. Supplementary, Mr. McCrossan. Maybe the Minister may visit West Tron to see if I'm reflecting simple negativity or the reality on the ground. Minister, I'm assuming you'll not agree with me on what I'm about to ask, but are we simply saying an increase in cross border trade as a result of the, the devaluation of the pound? Or, or do you believe that it's quite simply because we've pulled out of Europe? Um, what is your view on that, Minister? And what, what are, we, what are you going to do to install confidence or install confidence in the people of my constituency in West Tyrone? Mr Deputy Speaker, I will be very, very pleased uh, to visit uh, West Tyrone in the next couple of days as a result of an invitation from Tom Buchanan. Um, yeah. um, Tom, quick out of the traps, uh, has invited me down to the constituency. Uh, I know the member is, is new to the House, but perhaps a lesson for him to learn uh, from the veteran Mr Buchanan. Uh, who has got me down for a very, very busy day. He's, wor he's working me double hard on the, the day that I'm down in the constituency. I'm looking very, very pleased to, to be able to go down and accept that invitation to see uh, many successes that there are in the, the Western constituency. But, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry for the member 
that all of his predictions of doom and gloom, and he wasn't alone in the predictions of doom and gloom, are not coming to pass. Um, particularly, you know, we see today the Ulster Bank's latest PMI. Uh, people are trying to jump all over the last PMI to say that this, predict, you know, this backed up everything that they had predicted. Not the case. Our economy has bounced back. Uh, we are seeing uh, an increase in a growth in the private sector in Northern Ireland in, in August. And yes, there are a range of factors, a weakening of, of, weakening of sterling, boost in exports, and also cross-border shopping. But you know, the member seems to be talking down these benefits that are accruing for our economy. However they have accrued, whatever the reason for them, you know, let us take advantage of it. And it is one of the very many, many opportunities that we have as a result of leaving the European Union. And I and executive colleagues are absolutely determined that we get the best possible deal for Northern Ireland and that we have Northern Ireland perfectly placed to seize the opportunities that leaving the European Union presents. As Fran McCann isn't in his place, I call Carla Lockhart. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. I'm going to inject a little bit of positivity uh, yeah. into this, and I want to talk up the businesses in the Upper Band constituency. Uh, would, would the Minister join with me and praise local firms like Almac in my constituency who have contributed to recent success for Northern Ireland in exporting? Absolutely. I'm more than happy to join with the, the member in, in doing that. You know, I think we, we should be incredibly proud of what our manufacturing businesses have been able to do in terms of, of, of exports in very, very challenging circumstances over the last number of, of years. And, and it was really, really good to see uh, last week the latest figures published by uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, which only deals with manufacturing exports. It doesn't deal with services exports, but it was still incredibly good news uh, for Northern Ireland. We were the only region in the UK in the last 12 months, the 12-month period that they were looking at, to, to post an increase in exports. And it wasn't just a small increase, it was a significant increase of 9.5%. Uh, I think we should be incredibly proud of all of those businesses who have done that. The member represent, um, represents Upper Ban and has cited Almac, who are a fantastic Northern Ireland-based firm. Uh, and when you look at the analysis below HMRC's figures, um, one of the sectors who have driven in the increase in exports are health and life sciences, of which Almac is a key part of that sector in Northern Ireland. Some a 56% increase in the value of exports by health and life sciences companies like Almac, like Randox, and like, like Norbrook and, and others. So I think we should be should be celebrating that success um, and uh, trying to work with local businesses to, to try to encourage them to export, particularly uh, to export for the first time, uh, and to look beyond the possibilities of, of, of just selling into the Northern Ireland and the home market. Supplementary, Ms Lockhart. Thank you, and again, thank you, Minister, for, for that response. Um, certainly, we are very, very proud of it in Upper Ban, and I look forward to working with them alongside uh, your good self. Uh, can you also just maybe to the House explain a little bit more what uh, you are doing to increase it. I know we, we have seen a lot of positivity in terms of the figures, but is there anything specific that you're doing to try and increase exports going forward? Sir, Deputy Speaker, thank the, the member for, for her question. And you know, I think that it, it, there would be a temptation to sort of sit back and rest on your laurels when you post a 9.5% increase in exports. Um, I don't think we should be doing that. I think we should be looking at uh, the opportunities. I mean, a, a small regional economy like ours will not grow, will not become globally competitive, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the way that I, I want it and I hope the House wants it to become, if we do not look outside of Northern Ireland for, for opportunities to sell our, our goods and our services and our, and our products. And we should be incredibly proud, as I said, of the, those companies whose, whose products and goods and services are competing on an international stage and are beating uh, their competitors elsewhere. Um, so we have, we have worked, been working very, very closely with Invest Northern Ireland over the last number of weeks to bring forward a, uh, what we've called a trade accelerator plan for businesses in Northern Ireland. And this is the, exp the aim of building on that 9.5% increase and building on that success and also encouraging many firms to get into exporting for the first time. So it has a range of enhanced uh, supports, Mr Deputy Speaker, including Support for more visits into markets, raising, increasing that from just three to five. Uh, support for travel and accommodation uh, into, for, for firms to go into Great Britain and travel into the uh, support for travelling into the uh, Republic of Ireland as well. And that will particularly be attractive to first-time exporters. Um, we're also looking at enhanced uh, support for going to exhibitions and trade shows. Uh, a new GB market introduction programme, which will focus on the construction sector at the outset. 
A new ROI food retail development programme will also be targeting UK buying groups like the NHS. Um, we're doing more meet the buyer events and also market study events to, to complement our range of, of trade visits that we also already do. And also increasing the level and the amount of in-market trade support that businesses will get from 20 days to 30 days. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think that this all told and accumulated adds up to a, a pretty comprehensive plan, trade accelerator plan, which will help to build on that success that we've already had in exporters and encourage more businesses getting into selling their, their products outside of Northern Ireland. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I wonder, could the Minister um, inform the House of his view on the latest All Spring Purchasing Managers uh, Index Survey? Thank you, the, the member, for, for her question. I think I was very pleased to, to hear that our private sector, after a, a one month uh, of a blip after having had very many months of positive news with the Purchasing Managers Index, um, was mo again moving in the right direction, and that there was growth uh, in the private sector in, in Northern Ireland. Particularly pleased to see that uh, there was an increase in business activity in the manufacturing sector. Uh, in fact, we had the ha fastest rate uh, of growth uh, of any of the sectors was in manufacturing in Northern Ireland, and also pleased to see an increase in activity in retail. And in services, some concern, mind you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about a, a slight decrease, uh, which has been consistent over the last number of months in the construction sector, which had, of course, been, been bouncing back in recent times. And uh, also very pleased to see that the PMI is reporting for the 19th consecutive month uh, growth in employment in Northern Ireland, and also overall uh, uh, some good news and some, some good news in some sectors, also in terms of, of orders and contracts that have been awarded over the last month. Supplementary, Ms. Uh, thank you very much. I thank the Minister for that. Uh, the Minister will note that the author of the report uh, restates the underlying weaknesses in our economy which need addressing. Uh, how does he respond to the suggestion that the Chancellor's talk of a stimulus package in the UK should be replicated here in Northern Ireland? And does the Executive plan to do this? Well, you know, I, I'd be very keen to see the details of any a uh, stimulus package that the Chancellor for the Exchequer wants to bring forward in his autumn statement, which I think is now scheduled for the, the tail end of, of November. Obviously, the Northern Ireland Executive would, and Northern Ireland as a whole would hope to benefit from any stimulus package. And I also think it's important that um, we consider the detail of that. I mean, it's speculation at this stage. Let's see what the detail of that might be, what particular benefits that might bring for Northern Ireland. But you will not find uh, me wanting in terms of pushing forward ideas as to how we might utilise uh, a stimulus package or indeed the executive as a whole, I'm sure, uh, taking up the opportunity that one might present. Call Lord Morrow. Deputy Speaker, I'm sure the Minister will join with me this afternoon in expressing sincere and deep sympathy to a family in Dungannon. A young man lost his life yesterday evening as a result of an accident on a farm. And uh, I would just extend my sympathy to that family this evening, this afternoon, as they grapple with this dreadful situation. I'd also want to praise the Health and Safety Executive for their high-profile uh, media campaigns. Can the minister give us an assurance today that these campaigns will continue, while they will not? Unfortunately, accidents will occur, but I believe that they do play. These sort of campaigns play a significant role in ever alerting people to the dangers that there are, and I hope that there are plans to continue with these campaigns. Yeah. Sir Deputy Speaker, can I join with uh, Lord Morrow in, in expressing my sympathy to the, the family uh, in his constituency affected by this uh, very, very tragic accident. Um, thankfully, there have been a decrease, or has been a decrease, in the number of farm uh, fatalities on farms over recent years. But it, it does not take away from the gravity of the impact on this family, and indeed others who have suffered in the same way and absolutely tragic circumstances. And the, the family has my deepest condolences, as I'm sure members from around the house will, will join in expressing those condolences to, to that family. The member will be aware, I know, of the work of the Farm Safety Partnership, which has been established since, since 2012, and. Uh, again, I have been over the last number of months working with the Deira Minister in respect of this, and we were able to launch recently a, a farm safety affiliate scheme where we're working with 14 different organisations, a wide range of organisations, many that you would expect, like the Ulster Farmers Union, but also uh, companies like Lakeland and ABP and the, the Girl Guides and others, and banks and supermarkets, anybody who has reached into the rural community to try to increase uh, the message about uh, farm safety. Um, over the last number of years, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have ensured, in particular in this year, that uh, 
the health and safety executive's budget in respect to farm safety has been protected so that it can do some of the very positive work that the Lord Morrow has been talking about. Uh, the budget for campaign advertising this year, Deputy Speaker, is £230,000, uh, and that is going into a range of different measures, but also a, a, a new television advertising campaign, which I would hope that, that members would see on TV screens in the not-too-distant future. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am very, very keen to work with the farming industry, working, work with the farming sector to ensure that we can get the very important message about farm safety out right across that sector. I think that message is working, but I think we can, must continue to do more working in parallel with the sector to ensure that you know, their needs are also met, but most importantly, the issue of the, the very, very, very important message about farm safety is heard, is understood, registered, and has an impact. If we can be very brief, one minute left, a brief supplementary and a brief answer from the Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his very comprehensive reply. My next question was, and he has touched on it, and perhaps he doesn't have the figures, but could he give us the figures of the number of fatalities on farms in particular over the past five years? I accept that he may not have those uh, at his fingertips, but it would be useful to have them. Sir, Deputy Speaker, I, I do have the statistics here. Every, every single one of fatalities on the farm as a result of an accident is an absolute tra tragedy. Um, in 2011, the, the figures were there were 12 fatalities on farms across Northern Ireland. That number has fallen uh, by 2015 down to six, and there has been um, four to date this, this year. Um, so in one respect, you could look at those numbers, every single one a tragedy, and every single one having a deep and profound impact on the family involved and the, the local community. But we could look at those numbers and say, look, we're, the message is getting out there. We're doing a lot better. There's been improvements. But there has been uh, simultaneously a worrying increase in the number of non-fatal serious accidents which require medical attention. Uh, so we may be doing better in one regard, but slightly worse on another. And while somebody may not lose their life as a result of a, a serious accident, they may have their life limited. They may have their ability to work on the farm um, limited by the, the, the effects of that accident. So we do, it, even though the number of fatalities are going down, we still need to get that message about farm safety out and embedded into the rural community. Uh, and one of the things that we hope to do uh, to do that and to achieve that is to have a new farm safety action plan, which is in, in development and which we will work very closely with the farming sector on to make sure that we can be as, as impactful in a positive way as we possibly can. Okay, that's time's up now, and we.